it's about getting into schools and talking to young people because you know I, I know that people can change uh, and, it, and it's about talking to people and getting them to understand and perhaps step back from violence and, and prejudice and whatever and we just need to work together and keep on the good fight there absolutely Hey there guys, we are ecstatically happy to announce that we are associated with the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. The times are changing and with the unfortunate death of Sophie, those changes have made a massive impact for the future. If Sophie was with us still today, I can guarantee what you are doing will still be reaching so many lives of young teenagers, young adults and those who wish to be as different as possible. So thank you very much. To find out more about this incredible foundation and all the work they do, and more importantly, how you can help, head on over to www.sophielancasterfoundation.com. This is New Orleans comic book writer, Kurt Amaker, writer, rake, and raconteur, and you're listening to the Chronicles of Gast. Do you know what, guys? I'm not going to dick around this week. Welcome to the Chronicles of Podcast. It's the 47th edition. And Jamie, I do believe it's the Chronicles um, of Kurt Amica. You're damn skippy, it is. Phenomenal. Let's drive to New Orleans. Hit it! But uh, I think we should get to what we're all here for. Oh, yes. The peace. The peace of resistance. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Welcome to the Chronicles of Kurt Amica. Kurt is a comic book writer who has books with dead souls. Uh, Tad Caldwell, which I believe has now been made into a movie, Jamie. Yes, it is. A fucking movie. He is also friends with the Cradle of Filth lead singer Danny Filth and has created comics for him as well as the 69 Eyes. A man loves his goth bands because, yeah, this is awesome. I was so, I, I discovered this guy because from an advert from Cradle of Filth saying, like, we've done a comic created by Kurt Amaker. And I was like, that's freaking cool, writing a comic about a band. And I was like, oh, he's done loads of work. Let's reach out to this man. Like, and I love how passionate he is about what he does. And a man uses a lot of big words. And I just love people as well when we talk to them in the show that could just talk. My favourite guest is when you ask that one question, your next thing you know, they've answered your next five as well. Yeah, it's best, great. The best guests. Absolutely amazing. Fascinating conversation. A lovely human being to talk to as well. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, it's good. Obviously, he knows his history. He knows his goth history, vampire history, uh, the dark arts, should we say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's also a fascinating human being. Uh, really lovely guy. He used to be in the Marine Corps. Uh, did himself did himself a mischief uh, and got into comics. So, it's, cool. yeah, it's, it's good. It's a great story, like, from start to finish. So everything we talked about is... Just, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to go into too much detail because I kind of want you to just, like, take it for yourself and just enjoy it and just breathe it in. Ingest this beautiful man all the way from New Orleans. Kurt, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat to us. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, we really enjoyed. We're really excited to hopefully meet you one day uh, and check out from the bars and all the party life you got going on over there in New Orleans. Jamie! Yes, sir! Any final words? Thank you, Mr. Amaka. This is absolutely wonderful. And I will repeat what I said to you at the start of this interview. Definitely the best dressed guest I've ever had. Even Joe over Joe Gash? Oh, that's a good point. But he was dressed. He was a dapper, dapper human. So most smartly dressed guest I've ever had. Yeah, he's definitely, he's definitely up there. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, interviewing this week, a comic book writer, former Marine Corp, it's Kurt Amaker, the man himself. 
<laughs> the most best dressed guest we have ever had, I'm also going to add. Well, um, God, how could I respond to that without insulting all of your other guests ever? <laughs> <laughs> no, Bob means carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. all of you I don't know and have never met. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that one guy some time ago in that bar. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Time you were all taken down a peg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I know, I, uh, he said that you have met one of our previous guests. We know that for a fact. Who's that? Uh, Geeky? Uh, or- Ori Kimbler from Geeky Vengeance. Yeah, yeah. I think she uh, I think she interviewed me at uh, a signing a few weeks ago. That, well, a few more than a few back in May, I guess. Um, we I don't think it's run yet, though. I think it's uh, still sitting in the queue. But yeah, I saw she was from New Orleans. Yeah, 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 that's how. Yes, we know. We know. Look, look, I messaged her about you because I know she's also from New Orleans. Yeah, uh, she was upstairs with. Um, we had a, a shop signing for Free Comic Book Day here in the states, and they uh, had us. She just kind of like went down the row and interviewed each of us. So she the. Uh, it was fun. Uh, I remember she uh, she asked me what my uh, what my favorite food was. And I said, uh, right now it's braised beef short ribs. And she just stopped and went, well, I don't eat meat, so I guess I'll never try that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that does sound amazing, though. I might yeah, have to go to the States just to try it and then come back to the UK again. I think you probably make probably find it over there. Um, I mean, it's not exactly, it's not really exotic or anything like that. It's just, uh, it, it's impatience. And the, trip, the trick is after you've braised them to take them out and then crisp them under the broilers, so that little fat cake gets nice and... Uh, you know, nice and golden brown, but so. oh, Kurt. oh, I don't know what to do myself now. Give me a minute. <laughs> that sounds incredible. You say you got Tom dribbling. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I was in uh, I was in London a few years ago. I want to say back in 20, 2014. I was on my way back from Helsinki, and I stopped over for a few days. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's. The food was actually quite good. People make all these little cracks about British food, but I mean, it was, I really enjoyed myself. It was a good time. Um, the only, uh, the only criticism I'll say is that unlike New Orleans, uh, Londoners are not nearly as just overtly friendly. Like if you sit in a bar in New Orleans for long enough, eventually some stranger, welcome or not, will come talk to you. And London, that only really happened when I went to the Crow Bar. They're kind of like rock and metal bar. Um, and I met a few American expatriates and, people that knew some people that I knew and that kind of thing. But I mean, every other pub I went to the entire time I was there, I was just stones. I could have been like a statue, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah Londoners aren't <laughs> known for their friendliness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they just want to get to wherever they're going to, and they don't want to talk to about it. They just want to get there, all right? This, that's it. No questions asked. Uh, where are you guys uh, set up? Where, where in the UK are you all set up at? Um, I'm in uh, Newport, South Wales. I'm actually in Wales myself, so... And I'm from Birmingham in England. Okay. Yeah. Um, so have you been by the Black Sabbath bench? Yeah, I've walked past it quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a bit annoyed because they had like um, like a little Black Sabbath museum thing a little while ago, just before COVID, and I couldn't get to it in time. I was a bit annoyed. I was, uh, I to go I to was in Romania last fall, and they were on their second or third COVID lockdown, and about at least three things that I really wanted to go to were either closed or on very limited hours. So I was able to make them because they were, yeah, COVID just kind of wrecked everything for everyone. And, um, you know, it's been very controversial in the States because of course we have 50 States with our own independent government governors and all different opinions about how to deal with that sort of thing. So, so Jamie was to a nice introduction and now we just bombard the absolute living hell out of you with questions. How does that sound? Uh, good, as long as we stay away from contentious American politics. And, uh, oh, damn it. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. We won't talk about it for that. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, today we bring you a guest who has combined his love for horror, music and writing to become one of the most unique comic book writers in the land. His talents have led him to getting praise from legends like Alan Moore and working with artists like Cradle Filth and 69 Eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the chronicles of Kurt Amaker. Welcome, 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 sir. Welcome. Thank you for having me. 
It's just an absolute pleasure, sir. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're so yeah, a very, very busy man. Um, so we'll cut right to the real hard hitting shit, Kurt, which simply Indeed. is how was your pandemic season? Season. Oh, it was all right. It's I'm a bit of a homebody, so being locked down is not the absolute worst thing. I've, I've managed to turn my uh, my home into sort of a, a you know, it's just kind of a playland geared towards uh, mine and uh, my bride's interests. You know, so there's large screen TVs, plenty of books, plenty of graphic novels. Uh, you know, putting putting some uh, some of those home arcade games in my office. I just uh, I kind of got burned out. Um, going out a lot uh, back several years ago because I used to do uh, nightclub promotion, DJing and that kind of stuff. And I was on stage emceeing and, you know, kind of rocking out behind the DJ booth. And uh, <laughs> so I kind of, it's, it's it's not that I like completely antisocial. It's just that the appeal of like going out on a Friday or Saturday, a lot of the things people were missing um, outside of being able to dine in a restaurant without a, a partition or the waiter having to do this uh extended song and dance with the masks and the distance and am i too close so i don't know i have to put my mask on if i need to to go use the loo but uh not if i'm sitting down and it's all that that part was obnoxious but um other than that no it wasn't it wasn't terrible um you know i work at home so uh, <laughs> so nothing nothing slowed down i take it not really um i mean again there were some things like my the gym near my house closed for a like a month or so. So we would just go walk around Audubon Park and uh, uh, yeah, some restaurant. There was a couple of restaurants that never reopened, which is tragic. But for the most part, no, not a lot changed. I did get COVID uh, in September of last year and that had me locked up for a couple of weeks. It was, uh, it's, it's nasty stuff. I'm not a COVID denier or anything like that. I mean, it was, uh, it was pick the worst flu you've ever had and then uh, turn it up to 11. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, it's no fun. But take us back, sir, to when you were young, master amica, you could say. What did you want to be when you grew up? Was it always writing in comics? Or was it something completely different in total? I think my mother will tell you that I wanted to be an Olympic swimmer and that I went through, a, you know, an astronaut and about 10 other jobs. And I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure somewhere in there I wanted to grow up to be Dracula or, you know, a dinosaur <laughs> or something. But he, um. <laughs> Uh, honestly, no, I had a, I've always had a real interest in comics as a medium. And I, I initially started trying to draw this when I was about sixth grade and I was doing still life. So just basic kind of preliminary stuff. And I, I evidenced some talent, but I didn't stick with it. And that's entirely my fault. I was, I, I was actually, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's sort of faint praise, but I was becoming not bad. And, uh, the, but the issue is, and this is kind of obvious to this is well, maybe it's not obvious to some people, is that illustration is kind of a different animal than just drawing a, a bowl of fruit or a person mm-hmm. sitting there. Um, and I never got that far into it other than kind of like copying stuff out of like Wizard Magazine or other comic books I had. And um, but I recognized, of course, that comic books had writers, and they were typically, although some they were typically not the same person, that there's a creative team working on it. So, okay, well, I can definitely write. Um, that's, I've been, I was told I was a pretty good writer. Uh, I went to a couple of gifted, you know, sort of English and arts classes in high school. And um, so, yeah, I, I always maintain, I didn't really take the idea of writing comics or graphic novels seriously until uh, the early 2000s. It was just sort of something that was in my mind of like, oh, I'd like to do that one day. But it's like when you say, you know, Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna travel one day, or I'm gonna go back to school, or you know, it's just sort of it was kind of a thing. Off, of, I mean, I have gone back to school and have traveled, but it was it was not a thing that I really had a uh, had a serious line on. And um, I don't know, we're kind of segueing into a secondary topic. I can keep explaining this, or okay. or, or we can go back to you know childhood. Um, so Marvel. Marvel Comics had an imprint in the 80s called Epic, and they used it for more adult and kind of um, independent type stuff. So they reprinted ElfQuest uh, using Epic, and they um, they might have had a couple of manga titles, although I'm not, I might be misremembering that part, but they, they, they would do it for more adult and independent kind of stuff. It was an imprint, and they decided to bring it back in the early 2000s as a 
work from home opportunity for fans uh, whereby you could pitch and they would even maybe match you with a creative team and you would get um, you would get sort of a standard cut that everyone would get of X percentage or X number of dollars. And so it was an open call for submissions. It was meant to be a fan driven imprint, which sounds like a good idea until you realize that they, they obviously got buried under with submissions and then a whole bunch of, um, there wasn't any big like legal wrangling that I recall, but there's that question of, okay, well, if you submit who owns this and then when they did finally get, I believe one of the editors, um, who was spearheading the project was let go or he, or he moved on. And I don't remember exactly, but they ended up only putting it out as either an anthology of some of those fan submissions or stuff by Mark Millar and other comic writers that were already really well established where they're more like offbeat projects. So I had started working on a pitch with a guy I knew and then a guy I'd gone to college with. And then I was in the uh, Marine Corps reserves at the time. I was a weekend warrior, meaning you go to boot camp, you go to all the training and then you go about your normal life, but you show up to train uh, one week in a month and then two weeks in the year. But then the Iraq war happened in early 2000. My unit got called up to go over to Iraq in 2003. Uh, this would have been about March. And we were doing um, mount training, MOUT, which is essentially urban warfare training. They have these like bombed out empty buildings and burned out cars and stuff. And it's meant to teach you how to like fall and tumble on concrete and climb into windows and stuff. So uh, I was climbing into a window with my all my entire pack and armor plating and my weapon and everything with this guy um, boosting me up by the boot. And I was just a step on his shoulder and then scramble into the window above him. So I started trying to do that and then I fell and then I landed on one leg and destroyed my left knee. So I had to stay in California while my unit went to Al Kut, but they actually did not leave until Baghdad fell. Uh, so they were there trying to reestablish civil order and like keep the Iranians out and otherwise just like help them set up a police force. And so uh, I stayed at Camp Pendleton and I just worked in the mail room. I did physical therapy, answered phones, just kind of paperwork. So uh, a lot of free time laid up. So I started writing the script for that pitch that I, I had understood that the Epic program had kind of been uh, dissolved or, or seriously backburnered by Marvel. So I started working on the pitch um, and I was listening to a lot of like black metal and um, you know, the, the whether cradle counts as black metal is, sort of immaterial but it was in the mix of like emperor and dark throne and some of like phil and selmo's projects i went and saw danzig's uh blackest of the black festival when i was up there uh I, I should point out i was intermittently on crutches and then walking and then surgery and then back on crutches. so it was one of those, those, those times where i was walking not very well but enough to get myself around um so uh, i you know i I'd kind of taken an interest in uh black metal and extreme metal, which it started off with um, mostly with Cradle, but it was uh, out of listening to gothic rock and post-punk for years and years and kind of abandoning metal when I was younger. But Cradle kind of got me interested in reading about history and got me interested in literature again. And, and it was not, um, when I was in college, I wasn't like in trouble or like failing out, but I just was kind of a kind of a dumbass college kid. I was just playing video games and hanging out with my girlfriend and doing enough to get by for my, uh, for my bachelor's degree. But so this friend's like, you might like this band cradle of filth. Okay. Try that. Listen to it. I was like, wow, I think I really get these guys. This is a little, it was a little abrasive at first, but then I kind of, my ear got attuned to the screaming. And so I started catching the lyrics. I was like, Oh, this guy's actually a really good writer. Mm -hmm. And it really drove me to start reading a lot more history and nonfiction. And it kind of reawoken my interest in literature and the arts and history and, and not just being kind of a, a layabout and, you know, just going and hanging out at goth bars and again, showing up to exams 20 minutes late, trying to, uh, you know, trying to limp through college. So uh, keeping that in mind, I had had this idea for what became Dead Souls ultimately, which I, again, I, thought we would do with Epic, but then I started doing more seriously when I was laid up, writing it on a yellow legal pad. So uh, the book took 
several years to get together between dealing with the artist and who produced two drafts of the book, both of which were kind of a mixed bag. So trying to reassemble the book out of Photoshop and then letter, really learning how to letter in Adobe Illustrator and finally getting the first issue out. Um, I am still not real thrilled with how the miniseries turned out. Some of the writing is pretty good. The art is very questionable. Um, and so that's why I redid it uh, over the years in bits and starts in between other projects. But um, I published the first issue through Sarah Femmer of Books, who were out of Houston, Mark Morash, who um, is somewhere in the Northeast right now. I think he might be in Connecticut. And they have kind of switched over to doing more like um, political cartoons and kind of um, more ethereal artistic stuff. And at the time, I told Mark that if he would put the book out, I was willing to help him. I was willing to represent him at cons and like put in some legwork for the company. Um, so it worked out, sold a bunch of copies. Uh, that it, it, with the first one, but before the first one came out, I had this notion of interviewing Danny Filth for the back of the first issue because it had some thematic DNA with Cradle of Filth. And I want to be very clear that it was one of those cases where I wasn't trying to do a cradle themed superhero comic, but the comic obviously had some DNA with the sort of resurrected Vlad the Impaler and Elizabeth Bathory, but it was set in New Orleans. And because that see there, I knew all the street names and the neighborhoods and stuff um, from here originally. So, you know, part of the reason I set stuff in New Orleans is just because it's just easier for me <laughs> to write about it <laughs> off the cuff. And, um, I don't know what that says about me. I should probably actually, uh, I mean, I do try to research places when I write about them, but um, oftentimes this place is, is strange enough that it's, it's ample fodder for any story you want to set here. Um, but there was some thematic DNA between Cradle's music and the comic, and they were also unique and independent enough of each other that it it wasn't like, I like put a superhero cape on Danny Filth and sent him out to like fight crime or something like that. I don't um, love to say that. <laughs> uh, you think that now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but I got, I went through the proper channels. Amy Chiaretto at Roadrunner um, really helped me out. And it was good because with Sarah Femera behind me at that point with Mark, like Sarah Femera what is and what was is still as far as I know, um, a real company. And it wasn't just like a guy slapped a company name and a logo on a book and it's really just all his personal accounts and stuff. And so that actually did a lot towards getting us, um, I think getting through to him in a way that like when we, co we called Roadrunner when they were with them at the time around uh, after an amphetamine came out, we were able to say, Hey, this is Sarah Femmer of Books. We're interested in uh, setting up this interview. Can we get Dan to read the book and everything? Um, so it happened. The interview went really well. Uh, instead of really talking about music, although obviously we couldn't avoid that, we talked about you know more like literature and history. And I wanted to pick this guy's brain. This guy's brain. Uh, we got on really well. We kept emailing. Um, we touched base. So, you know, he had uh, the bride and I backstage a couple of times, several times now, but it's just sort of a friendship built out of that. I was able to branch out and network um, through Danny and also the 69 eyes. I was with a, um, I think not the gateway ahead of it, but I was, uh, we promoted one of those concerts with a, um, like a goth nightclub group. I was with I'm um, Yerky and I, same thing. We just kept in touch and he asked me if I'd work on their book. So I probably just answered like half of your questions in one info dump. I'm sorry. That's absolutely fine, Kurt. So that was lovely to talk to you, wasn't that? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> just let's just rewind slightly. Let's just rewind back to when you said you're in the Marines. Now, your dad was a naval officer, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So had you have not busted your knee, was the Marines, is that where you wanted to go with your life? Is that what you were thinking? This is what I'm going to do. Because you were saying like how graphic novels, like I'll get to that one day, but was the Marine Corps the way you wanted to go? Yeah. Well, I was in, I was in the Marines and I'd been in for a few years at that point. It wasn't, I didn't hurt my knee in boot camp. I hurt my knee in a, a training thing we were doing. For yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was in, I had my Logan anchor. Uh, I was an E3. Um, and this is just the first time we had been activated outside of the summer training. So um, when I got into boot camp, I had a notion of going to OCS and becoming a Marine officer after 
And honestly, I just, I got through boot camp and I said, this was fine, but I'm not sure that I want to do it again. Um, and <laughs> I, I mean, I was never in great shape physically or anything like that. I was never, never much of an athlete. So getting, uh, getting through boot camp was a huge achievement in and of itself. I mean, I'm talking about, I was the, the, I was a typical like kid in the trench coat that like hated all sports and wouldn't go near them. I mean, the first time I ever like <laughs> went on a run that didn't have a gym teacher behind me, making me do it for, for class or something was, you know, an absolute embarrassment outside of my parents' home. And uh, when they were living in Virginia, my dad was the Pentagon. Um, I, um, my father definitely vectored me more towards the Marines than towards the, the Navy or any of the other services. I'd always had a lot of interest in the Marine Corps. I like, uh, they had this aesthetic that I found kind of, uh, you know, kind of fascinating, kind of interesting. And they had this intensity about them that I really respected. It wasn't just a job you went to, to go to college. Marines have this kind of uh, I hate to say cult like because it sounds like an insult, but I don't mean it as such. I mean, it was really like once you were in, you were in forever and you were like there, you were part of the brotherhood. And I mean, it's it did it served me really well. It's helped me get jobs. It's besides the GI Bill I got out of it later. And uh, you know, it's whatever you meet another Marine in a bar or see, you know, or you, you could be at a freaking grocery store or something. Although the area I live with is crawling with veterans. Cause there's a couple of, there's a base here and there was one that's um, just a federal facility now, but so I don't, I don't talk to every Marine veteran I see on the street because if I did that, I would never, because this whole area is just overrun <laughs> with Navy and Marine vets. Um, but no, I was happy to do it. I'm, I'm not, um, like, I don't regret having joined the Marine Corps or anything like that. I definitely had a thought that I was going to go be an officer and do it full time. But I found that I was okay with being a reservist. I said, I'm just it's kind of fun to go um, play in the dirt and ride around in Humvees and shoot stuff, you know, yeah. <laughs> every so often. But I'm going to finish college and get on with my life. <laughs> so you're saying like you wrote Dead Souls, like, but again, like Tom said a minute ago, you, it was always that I'll write a book eventually. What was it that made you actually go, right, no, I'm going to sit here, get this yellow legal pack, and I'm going to write this book. What was that trigger that made you actually do it? The initial impetus was the EPIC program, because it's, it's probably, you all probably understand this, but just for anyone who doesn't, getting into comics via submission is very difficult. Most companies don't take uh, cold submissions anymore. And the ones that do, you're just as likely to end up in the, uh, in the circular file as you are to end up in front of an editor's desk. They just get too many of them. There's too many legal issues with um, if you send in a pitch without, uh, without it being requested by an editor or something, it's like, and then they put something out like that, even that resembles it. You get this whole like, oh, you stole my story kind of thing. And now I'm going to sue you for a million dollars. I mean, this happens to uh, it happens to musicians fairly often because some dumbass writes some songs and sends them to Trent Reznor or Robert Plant or whomever. I'm thinking because both of the people that I'm thinking of who had this happen is Led Zeppelin. I know for sure has Nine Inch Nails definitely has. There's been a few others where uh some guy writes a bunch of songs and then sends them and is like, wouldn't it be cool if you perform these? And then of course they never hear back from the, the artist. And then something comes out, the guy thinks that it's his song. So comics, the comic companies, even image, um, the opportunity to just send in a submission is just very rare. Occasionally they'll have open submission calls, but your best bet is to know people by way of however you get to know people. I don't know, go to cons, talk to a bunch of editors, buy them a drink, chat them up, make sure that they know that you're not a crazy person, put out some <laughs> stuff yourself, get to, you know, it's just, it's it's like anything else. You stumble upon it. But, so for them at my age, not understanding a lot of this, the idea that they were really legitimately going to take a pitch and that they might look at it was, I said, okay, if there ever was a chance, this would be it. And of course, as I said, they were deluged with submissions by people that had the same idea. The reason why I started writing it um, as such when I was laid up is one, I had the time to do it. Um, I had an idea that I liked initially that I had worked out. And then um, a movie with the dearly departed Heath Ledger came out called The Order. It was a sort of Catholic church, supernatural conspiracy thing. 
uh, it came out and had almost the exact same plot. So um, I'm not saying that they didn't steal anything from me, but I had my idea worked out and they were alarmingly similar. That does happen. So I went well into the circular file with that one and let's start over. And I, um, I just had time to write and work out an idea that I had no idea where it was going. I had a premise, I had a seed of an idea and I said, okay, well, I got not much else to do. Uh, I, I was working in, like I said, uh, offices and stuff, but a lot of time I was just laid up. I was like, I could, I could go to like from my desk to the bed and not much else. And so I was like, all right, well, let me see where this idea goes. And I just kind of push it out and let it, let, let it carry to carry me where it care, where it goes. Um, so that was it. I had the time I had decided that the idea was good enough and had enough legs that I was, I wanted to see it through. It was people say like, well, where do your ideas come from? Well, they come, everybody has ideas. The question is being receptive to them and then writing them down when you land on a good one. I have like 10 ideas a day and most of them are forgettable. Occasionally, if one stays with me for a few, a few weeks, whatever, I go, mom, maybe I should uh, flesh that out because if it's still in my head, if it's still kind of uh, kind of gnawing at me, then maybe I should consider developing it. And that kind of happened with Dead Souls. I was like, I like this idea. I think it's marketable. And even if the idea is kind of absurd on its face, there's an audience for this kind of thing. This sort of like, um, keep in mind, this was a few years after uh, Blade and The Crow and then the under and Underworld movies hadn't come out yet. But that kind of goth action, twin, you know, black leather trench coat, twin pistols with a, you know, with a samurai sword. There were, if you look back during that time period, there were a lot of movies like that. And so it was meant to be something in that vein, no pun intended. Um, but it, and, and again, the idea is a little silly on its face, which is why when I redid it, I made it deadly serious and got fleshed out the history a lot more and tried to make it as sort of like grown up and as legitimate as I could, I suppose. But um, that that subgenre for lack of, you know, you want to call it gothic action or dark action. I mean, there were a whole lot of movies like that and some comics and um definitely around the Vampire the Masquerade role-playing game at that time. So I knew I had a market for the idea. Um, and so it was just a matter of going, okay, I would be wasting my, I would be wasting a really good, legitimate kind of germ of an idea if I just forget about this one and don't do it like ever. And, and in the process, I kind of took a look at my life and I said, what am I going to do with my time and how serious do you want to be about comics? And comics are very important to me. So I, quit playing console video games. I sold my PS2. Um, I knew I had to read. I knew I had to write. I knew I had to get a job. I knew I had to get married. And I just said, okay, I'm going to legit focus on this and start taking the idea seriously and not just be that guy at the bar who's like, oh, I'm going to write a screenplay one day. You know, New Orleans is overrun with guys like that. And they're they're virtually all guys. When I say guys, I mean guys. <laughs> I love that though you say like how you've rewrote Dead Souls to make it a bit more serious and whatnot. It's obviously it shows how much you have a love for that story though. Instead of just going, I'll write a whole new story, let's forget about that one. You're like, no, I have a love this story. I will make it the best I can make it. Yeah. So that was um well, that was the driving impetus, is that it was the it was a thing that got my got my foot in the door with comics. And I thought the art was very rough. I thought the writing, I thought the premise, some of the ideas it put forth were good. And the prose itself is, is not bad. It's not like ridiculously awful or anything, but the, the, the way it gets to some of those ideas I felt was a little juvenile. And so when I redid it, I, um, I recast what in the, um, the original one was a cult, like uh, with hoods and religious services. I recast them as like, uh, security service, like a freelance, like um, defensive security service, kind of like a Blackwater type thing that it turns out is obviously a lot more going on. But I was, I, I was like, let me, I was sort of like, let me pretend this is more, more Tom Clancy and less like Underworld or The Crow. Like, let me pretend this is like, this is really happening. And it's in, it's in something that's recognizable as our world, our world. And it deals with police and security services and international inquiry. And once I did that, it was a lot more like I am, it was a lot more where I read it and I go, okay, this is not, 
obviously someone's first comic book. Um, unfortunately, the reboot of Dead Souls not sell nearly as well as I was hoping because I really like it. And I look back, I, excuse me, um, I look back and I still really like it, but there was a delay dealing with one of the printers I was working with. And so there were pre-orders. I think those got filled by the bookstores and stuff. I hate to say that, but I told everyone where they could go get it or if they had bought a copy that they never received that I would give them one or send them, at least give them a PDF, buy them over. And then, you know, I try to take care of my customers, but the whole thing was a bit of a debacle. And then I don't know if it just was too dense and kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it. If it, I don't want to say it was too smart for the audience because I don't really think that, but it was just more like the combination of subject matter was too personalized. It was like I was writing the book I wanted to read. And sometimes you do that and you go, wow, this is great. I love it. But you just realize that that's what I'm interested in. That's not what the whole world is mm. interested in. That happens to a lot of, um, that happens to a lot of creative types. You put out something that you absolutely love and you're like, hot damn, this is going to be great. And then you just go, well, that's what you like. That's not what the rest of the world <laughs> necessarily likes. <laughs> So I was saying before, yeah, I don't mean to again. I don't mean to insult my audience. I mean, if it doesn't take, it's if it doesn't catch on. I, that's that's entirely my responsibility. I'm not saying it was too intelligent or too dense or too literary or anything like that. I said I think it may have just been a combination of too many. It was a pizza with toppings that only I like and <laughs> could <laughs> with each other. What a superb <laughs> way of putting it! I like that. <laughs> <laughs> So, as I said in my intro, you know, you received some great praise from several people for this book, including comic legend Alan Moore. How did how did Alan Moore get his eyes on it? And that must have been a very surreal moment for you. Uh, I was writing for a website called Cinescape. It used to have a print magazine. And then later it became Mania.com. Uh, and it was... Um, I think when they changed it to Mania, it was purchased by one of those companies that owns like several news and news sites and commentary sites. Like the crack.com is not owned by the crack company. They're owned by a media conglomerate that owns like 10 other websites. Uh, um, I'm sure you all are aware of this. I'm just explaining to the audience. So Cinescape had been around for years as a magazine. And then the magazine kind of sputtered and then stopped coming out the website kept going and um i was being paid pretty consistently and i was chasing down a news story uh when alan left um dc comics over the whole um blow up with the v for vendetta film uh, i spoke to a couple of people that worked with him for quotes and stuff for a news story about it um because the high free reign on the column it could be an opinion piece it could be news analysis, it could be interviews. And so um, I got to know uh, Chris Staros, who was his editor at Top Shelf at the time. And Top Shelf was going to put out Lost Girls, which was his work of uh, elegant literary pornography. And well before the book came out, well, well, long before he sent me a gallery copy of it, meaning just a big Xerox copy with a chip flip on it. And um so I was one of the first people to read it outside of Alan and his wife, Melinda Gebby. So we set up an interview. We did the interview. It went really well. It was really long. Um, Alan and I got on pretty well. Um, I felt like we had kind of had a good rapport. So I would call him occasionally for quotes for other stories. You know, like when people do in the news, they're like, and here's what, um, you know, here's what Corey Taylor from Slipknot thinks about this, that kind of thing. Um, I would call him for like uh, quotes on and commentary on news pieces I was doing. I interviewed him a few more times and somewhere in there we had developed, um, I guess you could call it a friendship, but we've never met in person. So um, we, at one point I tried to arrange that and he was in the middle of working on his novel Jerusalem and told me uh, I'm too busy. And Neil Gaiman just tried to call, so tried to do the same thing. So don't take it personally. That's paraphrasing the conversation. I said, all right, well, uh, we've spoken a few times since then. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. It's not for, it's not for like any need to avoid him or anything. It's just, um, he's very, very into film right now. Um, but if I, you know, if I picked up the phone, he would re remember me, but we were talking a lot over the years and just found that, you know, he's a, he's a he's a really bright, intelligent, funny guy, and he often is misunderstood or taken out of context by by the media. And I feel that that's unfair. But uh, 
besides all that, uh, the answer to your question is that I was work. I got the first issue of the comic out and I said, can you give me a cover quote for the second one? Cause we had a cover quote from Danny on the first one. And he said, yeah, sure. Send it on. And he read it and he said, wow, this is really good. So here's your quote. Uh, so he gave me a fulsome little mini review and years later, I told him, I said, you know, I appreciate the quote, but I mean, that book was really, really raw. And he goes, he said, yeah, but I could see the writing through the rawness. I could see that there was something good under there. So, um, you know, that that's all it was, is we had developed sort of a, an ongoing conversation, series of conversations. And then I asked him about it when I was well, it, it, wouldn't, it wasn't out of the blue at that point. We were talking about politics and media and comics and art and whatever the hell we were just having normal conversations in between doing interviews and stuff and you know so it wasn't a big deal by the time i asked i guess is the the short mm-hmm. version of it so obviously we've mentioned cradle of filth 69 eyes and whatnot and you've worked with those to make comic books for the bands how yeah. did that come about did they approach you did you approach them through friendship or with 69 Eyes, uh, Yerky, at Yerky 69 asked to come do a DJ gig in New Orleans after we had put the band on with this promotional group I was working with called Corrosion. Uh, we would book concerts and goth club nights and I'd DJ and I would go on stage and my sunglasses on and be like, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And, you know, just just kind of ham it up. And uh, so we we booked the Eyes to play and Yerky and I got on pretty well. Um you know, we just drank and partied through the quarter one night. And then he got in touch with me later and said, Hey, I want to come DJ. I DJ by myself on the side. I just do like appearances. So it's a signing slash DJ gig. I'll, I'll like hang out with people. Um, I said, all right. So um, true blood was really big at the time. So I contacted HBO and asked if we could do like a official unofficial Fantasia event based on the vampire bar in that's in those novels and on the television show. Uh, I worked out logistics with HBO so that they said the short version of the conversation is we won't give you any money and you can't use the logo, but we will permit you to use the name itself. Like just you call it Fantasia, but we're not going to help you and you cannot use the artwork. I said, all right, good enough for me. Um, so I had a Yerky and a few other local like vamp DJs in the goth and kind of a uh, vampire like lifestyle scene and um, went pretty well. We did a few more of them. And in the, but on the first one, uh, Yerky asked me if we would do a 69 eyes comic book. So I went to Mark. I said, yeah, we should definitely do this. So Mark and I and a bunch of other artists did this sort of Canterbury tale style story where people all tell a different portion. It's like that, uh, Sandman issue with uh, the the um, tavern at the end of the world. I think I'm trying to remember what the name of uh, what the name of the, the arc is, but it's where there's a bunch of people trapped in this sort of supernatural tavern in that they can't seem to get out of. There's a, a snowstorm that never ends outside, and so there are sort of travelers from different dimensions, and they all have, have like um, they all have different stories to tell, different sort of, and they're obviously all kind of connected to the Sandman mythology. So we had this idea of a bunch of kids outside of a concert and they would each tell a portion of a story where they were kind of making up um, Yerky and the 69 Eyes as fictional biography under the premise, of course, that they are all real vampires. And then naturally by the end of the story, we find out that it's all true. You know, you know, newsflash for spoilers for a story that, you know, it's like, it's like every every anthology show, like every episode of Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone, where where as a premise like that, it's like, guess what? The kids' dreams were all real, or the whatever the monster really does. <laughs> there really is a monster into the bed. So that was um, but uh, Danny liked the 69 Eyes comics. He had gotten copies either either I sent them to them or he bought them. I don't remember, or he got them from the band, I don't remember, but he um had gone through uh, someone he had talked to about doing a cradle comic, somebody who had done comics for a couple of death metal bands. And I don't know the guy's name and I'm not trying to like shit on him. I don't really know anything about him, but he, the guy had put together a pitch or gotten started and Danny really didn't like it. And so he said, would you, um, would you do a cradle comic? And I said, yeah, of course. Um, So once we like, 
basically Danny and I had to do everything ourselves. We didn't have a lot of outside support. So it was him, myself, and then Monty Bohr, the artist, and Jamie Huntley, who did the cover. Um, and we did a Kickstarter campaign to raise the money for it. Obviously, there was no legal issues in terms of using the band's artwork or lyrics because Danny ultimately has ownership of all that stuff, as far, as far as I know. Um, but the um, everyone, the record company and the management, everybody else was just kind of like, uh, that just, we're not gonna, you know, not really interested. So Danny and I just plowed ahead. We did the Kickstarter. Um, I have friends that have a t-shirt company. They do sort of like Gothic and Lovecraftian, uh, kind of just sort of alternative kind of cute kind of, I don't want to say hot topic -y type shirts because they're much more original and interesting than that. But, um, they were able to help me get the shirts together, deal some of the international shipping, uh, the, ordeal became so like overwhelming that I had to quit my day job at the time and do comics full time for a while. Um, I, because in order to cut down costs, like I did a lot of the shipping and then my friends who had the t-shirt company, psychographics, Psy, S I G H co C O period psycho. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. Sorry. yeah. Um, <laughs> They're still they're still around too. They do great work, and they have printed all of my shirts. And um, and then you know they still let me. Uh, I'm still allowed to sell that cradle shirt. But they had a shipping facility uh, in Portland where they're set up. They run the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, so they they were like, look. Um, they didn't say you seem like you're in over your head, but I think that was the kind of sub that was the subtitle written underneath and stuff <laughs> that said. We're going to distribute all the shirts for you and we're going to distribute, we're going to do the international shipping for you. So just send us a couple of cases of the books and the, you know, the Excel file with everything. And we'll, you know, so I, I handle all the domestic shipping by myself. I sat at my kitchen table with mailing supplies and slap, put comic books and little voodoo dolls and stuff in, in envelopes and put labels on them and then ran them to the post office in the middle of the night to use the automat for, uh, for postage um so yeah it uh i i'm pretty proud with how the how the book turned out it is very much like myself and danny's vision raw and uncut and that can be a good thing can be a bad thing in the case of uh you know i, I was joking with a friend of mine who said everybody says they want to see the creator's vision well that's what star wars episode one was that was george lucas with all the money in the world as, much, as long as he wanted it to be anything he wanted, that was his pure uncut vision in which no one would tell him no about anything. And um, I, I think in the in that case, it didn't work out very well, though I, I'll tell you that the movie has grown on me over the years, mostly just because I think the little annoying things have kind of, the, the sharp edges have been sanded down by time. Yeah. Um, but that's a case where, someone had all the money and all the vision and all the talent. He could have done anything he wanted. And that's what you got. Sometimes you do need an editor to step in and tell you, no, I think the cradle comic um, overall, I think is very good. Um, I'm happy with how it turned out. There are a little, you know, I always go back and go, oh, we should have put this or put this here, put this here. But um, I am pretty happy that I can tell people that, that, that's me and Danny and Monty and Jamie. It's no, there's no like outs. There was no outside, editing or outside interference or like, no, you can't do this because of this. So if you want to know what our imagination looks like, that's as close as I can get to. You know? <laughs> um, just going back to say where you have seen with the 69 eyes, you were DJ. How did you find to DJ then? How did that, how did you even get into doing that? Uh, so after Katrina, I had a housemate uh, who was well, more like a, a renter guy that I was friends with that rented a room from me. And he wanted to do a DJ night at this coffee bar that uh, some friends of ours had just bought. And the place was kind of kind of alternative and kind of like offbeat. And so we were all friends in the goth scene and we had hung out together. We were sort of more of the trad goth, less electronic. We were in the like the Sisters of Mercy and the Cure and Bella Morte and, you know, just um any any bands like that less less so than like um ebm or industrial music and so he said well i'm gonna put on a goth night at a coffee at, at the coffee bar that our friends own and i said well can i can i dj there can i jump in and he said yeah of course so we started off doing it there and then we moved on to a bar and nightclub and then we moved to i think we 
we might have had one more move in there. Actually, I'm thinking we stayed it for the entire time, the entirety of the time I was there. I think we were at the same club, but I think we almost moved a couple of times. But anyway, um, we had a falling out at some point. And so I was no longer with them, but I was with another group that I had already started working with at the same time. So the other group, Corrosion, we started booking concerts and DJ nights and stuff like that and just bringing in some of these bands and footing the bill for it, negotiating, booking sponsors from like local businesses, record stores, and um, just the t-shirt company, uh, whoever else we could get involved, my comic book publisher. So um, it was a fun time. I, uh, I got, honestly, I kind of got my fill of nightlife and that's something that throws people off because I used to just be really just an absolute party animal back when I was younger and it's not that I like look back on it ruefully or with regret, but I just, I got my fill up to here. At that <laughs> point. And so I've seen it, I've done it. I've been, you know, uh, I've been out all night. I've had all the crazy adventure. I've had enough crazy adventure to fill a lifetime. And I'm sure there are, there are people that in new Orleans that keep doing that forever and ever. And I especially have friends that come in from out of town where they don't have that kind of thing. And so they're really excited. They want to go hit all the goth bars and just like race hell till five in the morning. And I'm like, I sorry, I'll maybe for a little bit sometimes, especially if um like when Cradle of Filth was in here playing with Danzig uh, a few weeks ago. Like I went out. There's a kind of semi-private vampire bar uh, above another bar in the French Quarter. So I took them there because it's reasonably quiet and people were not gonna like bother Danny or anything like that. So um, I just. I, I loved it while I was doing it, but it was kind of like consuming my life and I didn't have time for a lot of other things. It, we were planning a night. We were putting up flyers on telephone poles and calling sponsors and just working kind of like in the end, it was like we a lot of it was we were paying to play. I just looked at kind of the numbers after a while. And I said, we're pouring an amazing amount of money into this and we're not getting a lot back. The, most of the time the shows come in under because these are sort of small and medium sized bands where I mean, they're, big bands in the world of goth industrial music, but New Orleans goth scene is not actually that big, which surprises people. Um, it's like, I would say there's a core of maybe a hundred people, maybe even less than that. And then there's all the people that are sort of ancillary to it. Like me that kind of, yeah, okay. You like that stuff, but you got old and stopped going out. Or there's people that are more like, you know, kind of, uh, I guess we would have called them like Marilyn Manson kids. I'm not sure if they want to be called that now, but, um, <laughs> you know, there are people like that that are sort of adjacent to it, where there's a really big concert, they might come out. But if, for the core, like, club-going goth scene, there's maybe like 100 people here. Uh, there's just so much to do. And New Orleans is not, a, New Orleans is a town that's very, like, um, alternative, alternative friendly. It's very queer friendly. It's very, like, you, you really... The, the sort of uh, the, the meta narrative underlying a lot of alternative people that they're, they're sort of persecuted because of how different they are. Like nobody likes me because I have pink hair. I mean, that just doesn't really happen in New Orleans. I mean, you have to, you'd have to pretty much like throw rocks at yourself or something to find that kind of like, you know, it's like, okay, it might've been that way in a, a small town or something like that. But New Orleans is like every third person is piercings, tattoos, dyed hair. I mean, that stuff has become, more normalized writ large in the States, especially in the, in major urban centers, but New Orleans has always been very kind of accommodating and live and let live and that kind of stuff. So there's just not that, that whole, like, Oh, we need our little core group to stick together. It doesn't apply as much. There's just so much to do here. There's a bar on every street, uh, not in every street. I mean, there's like, I live in a residential area, but I do have a bar about a couple of blocks away. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I love how diverse it is. It's great. I, I need to. I need to visit. I have to come out and look because yeah. I love. Yeah, you. for sure. I've always wanted to go to New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. There is a uh, on on the side of the river where I live. There is a proper. Um, it's a. It's not an Irish pub. It's an English pub run by a couple of expatriates. It's not one of those pub in the box like the Flanagan things you find in every town. <laughs> it was uh, started by a couple of British expatriates. So um, and they have a. Uh, English crisps and um, they used to have pole cask ale. I don't know if they do anymore, but um, it's a, it's a good place. I'll take you guys there. If you ever come down. Oh, yeah. Def- you're on. Quite, yeah, absolutely. So while I was um, doing my research, for this, I saw one of your books, Tad Corwell. Did I see it's being made into a movie? 
It is. Uh, they, they filmed it in 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, the director, Laura Duvall, managed to pull together um, a low-budget production. Uh, again, it admits very, very trying circumstances. They had to have COVID testing routinely uh, on set, and everything had to be according to protocol. It was done as... Um, I was... I have to specify this and I'm proud of them. I say low budget. It is a SAG AFRA like union low budget picture. So it's a real feature length movie. It's not like a YouTube thing or a student film. It's going to be about 90 minutes and it'll be submitted to festivals. Um, I don't know if it's going to be in theaters, but then again, what is these days? Unless it's like Top Gun or an Avenger sequel. <laughs> Most, you know, in like I have a shutter subscription and it's one of it's something that absolutely pays for itself. There's so much good indie stuff on streaming now that you can just watch movies all day and all night, and never run out. So um, if it goes to the theater, fantastic. If it doesn't and it just goes to streaming, that'll be OK, too, because it's in good company right now. All the most interesting stuff is going straight to streaming, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I know everybody envisions their movie on the big screen. It's just it's just is it's a reality of the uh, the industry right now. It must Did be. Have a- Sorry, Jay. I was going to say, did you have much involvement in the project? A little. Uh, I went through and touched up the script. There's a couple of things we had to change because of logistical or budget budgetary reasons. Like in the comic book, it takes place in the summer. And in the movie, we decided to have it set it over Christmas break because they were filming in December. And so when they did outdoor shots, there are Christmas decorations on people's houses and stuff. So we had to, there's no way we could have explained around that. So we just said, okay, so it'll be in winter break instead of summer break. So no big deal there. So there was some, um, there was certain issues like that that had to be rewritten. Uh, some things that just, I don't know, like there's a scene in uh, the, in the comic where a couple of the characters are eating at like an outdoor table at a fast food restaurant. And so they just moved into a park and they're just eating at a like a, at a picnic table instead because it's free to shoot at a park or you know something like that so the it's the script was polished and fixed to accommodate little things like that by and large it's faithful to the comic book um and so laura had me work through some of that stuff and then she had me watch casting videos of the various actors it was the one i knew she was serious because she had talked about making a movie out of it several years ago but she was kind of just starting out in film, not just just starting out, but you know, like just attending her first class. But as far as getting a toll, getting a toehold in the industry, um, and she talked to me about it over the years. And then finally, she said, "I'm going to do it. Um, everybody wants to work because of COVID, so people are willing to come out and work on like contingency or work for cheap or however. Or some people just want to help, and we'll." Like, I need you to brush up the script with me and then go through and watch his casting videos. Tell me who you like, who you don't like and why. And so, yeah, I was involved in that to that extent. But I also I made it pretty clear to her um, from the beginning. I said, I'm a comic book writer. I'm not filmmaker and that I love movies. I'm not being trying to be mean to them or anything. But I said, this is your this is your deal. It's an adaptation of my work. So if you have to change something. Uh, as long as it's not really obnoxious, as long as you're not trying to like, I don't know, don't use my movie to go after your Twitter enemies. Not that she has any more is actually very cool, but I was like, <laughs> don't put anything like overtly contemporary or like, obvious or like or didactic. Like let the story teach whatever lessons are inherent in the material. Uh, I said, don't do that. Don't um, just leave the spirit of it intact. And if you need to make like little logistical changes or changes in the casting then you know i can live with that um so that was that was it i went by set during uh during and again this is during covid so i was all masked up and everything i went by the set i brought a stack of the books i handed them out to the actors i had a little sit down with everyone with the cast and thanked them for being there coming out and answering any questions and signed a book i had like a little like meet and greet with the whole cast i did that uh, twice and uh, yeah it went really well overall I was I'm very happy with it it's not I've seen some of the raw footage uh, it's being edited right now by Savage Light Studios in New Orleans so it's underway it's just it takes a while you know so it's been in the can for uh, I guess a year and a half at this point uh, but we're hoping to get it out by like the end of the summer one way or another so amazing That's it must cool. be so cool to see one of your stories come to life almost it must be incredible <laughs> 
it's surreal. The first time I saw um, uh, Olivia Worley dressed as a uh, Teresa, the Finnish goth girl, that's the kind of uh, one of the, the main characters besides Nathan. Uh, it was legitimately weird. Uh, I was at a, um, I went to this, um, it's like a gaming, it's a gaming store and they have like, so it's like tabletop gaming, but they also have like a, I don't know, they have like a bar and they have a little restaurant and stuff, but it's meant to like people to order food while they play Warhammer and that kind of stuff. So they converted that into a video store for shooting the film. And I just, I didn't announce who I was when I went other than like speaking to Laura, but I didn't like, you know, tell the cast who I was until I'd been there for a little bit and just walking around and kind of taking it in, especially when I saw Olivia in costume, she didn't see me. She like passed me in a hall and I didn't say anything because it was so surreal. Like it wasn't unpleasant, but it was just like, Oh my God, this, this is a, a thing that I came up with that was based on my life and experience is not, not too, too much. I mean, there's tidbits of stuff. I mean, I'm not, Ted Caldwell on the Monster Kid is not a biography. My father is still alive for one thing. And um, I deliberately wrote Nathan, the main character, as being um, a little, he's a bit of a dim bulb. He's not, he's not super intelligent. He's not a big reader. And that kind of comes into, into play in the story. Um, but seeing Olivia dressed up like Teresa and just her, it was, it was haunting, I guess would be the best way I could put it. And uh, after I got used to it, I took it in for a few minutes. I introduced myself to the cast when they weren't shooting, obviously. Um, and then it was it was much better when I went back. The I went back to set a couple of more times. It was a little easier at that point because I'd gotten over that initial shock. But I, uh, you know, I don't. I never wrote comics with the intention of making having them turn into movies. I'm not. There are comic companies out there, and you see them when. Um, Sometimes you'll see where there will be like a spate of like indie, like indie films come out that are based on, or, or maybe not even independent, sometimes bigger studio films that are based on non superhero comics. Like there's a Grendel TV show coming out from Netflix um, coming soon. And so you hear, you see these times where they like make a pass. They're like, okay, we've made movies out of all the superheroes or all the ones that like your parents have probably heard of. And now we're getting into the secondary and tertiary stuff. And so I have seen comic studios pop up that are clearly publishing Netflix pitches or movie pitches. And so they'll put out a mini series and it's like, it's like this, but set in the old West, it's like this, but in space. And you're like, this is not a comic book. This is a movie pitch that you just figured that, and um, you know, some, there are a couple of times there have been some decent movies that have come out of those projects. But a lot of times I, and I, I, I don't want to tell tales out of school, so I'm not going to name names because I don't like beating up on other people in the industry. But I've seen at least three studios I can think of that came up and then they would get like one movie made out of like 10 projects. And then and in some cases, the movies don't even really do well. So I always wrote comics just for themselves. However, and this is going to sound contradictory, but I don't think it is. I never wanted to make it really hard for them to be turned into movies. So I put it a lot of emphasis on dialogue and on talking heads, people talking, people doing stuff that can be filmed relatively cheaply. Um, a lot of stuff, uh, the more special effects, heavy type stuff done briefly or done by implication. Um, so like Tad Call was a story where there's some alien scenes and stuff. And if you wanted to, you could expand upon those and you could put a lot more kind of sci-fi imagery or you could keep it as it is in the book where it's just kind of flashes. It's like people seeing things in dreams and visions of like aliens standing around or, or, or just kind of like sort of psychedelic kind of uh, laser light sort of stuff. Um, so it can be expanded upon, it can be made more detail or it can be kept the way it is in the book where it's very brief. I remember asking Laura Duvall, I said, how are you going to film? I mean, if we're running on like, a very limited budget here. How are you going to film all the alien stuff? And she said, have you read your own book recently? I was like, <laughs> like past few years, she said, there's only a few, she said, there's only a few scenes like that in there. The rest of it is fairly standard stuff. It's people talking and going into video stores and um, arguing and, you know, all, all of its stuff. It's fairly easy to stage with practical effects. So I said, all right, well, uh, my trick worked. Um <laughs> 
<laughs> so speaking of uh, movies that are low budget and lots of talking in it, people that know me know I am a huge Kevin Smith fan. Yeah. And one thing I learned about you is you had a part in Jane Silent Bob reboot. Is that right? I was one of the vendors at the um, at in the con scene, and my part is one of the. They have a bunch of like bonus footage, kind of like deleted scene stuff during the credits. Uh, you can see me talking to Derek Donovan, who is a comic artist who also lives locally. He's done stuff for DC Comics. Uh, he did the infamous. Um, uh, with green, this the issue where Green Lantern's girlfriend gets chopped up and crammed into a fridge. He drew that, um, but Derek is still working and he's uh, he's still active. And he and I are behind a hologram of Chris Hemsworth talking that was meant to be a joke in the movie. Where when you came into the con, Chris Hemsworth would give you this sort of series of instructions, and it was you know it's meant to be a lark because he, he keeps going. Goes well if you want to go here, go here, and if you want to do this go here and if you want to do this and go here then you have to go there it was meant to be a kind of like <laughs> play up the progressive absurdity of the instructions he's supposed to be giving the attendees and they walk in so Derek and I are behind it talking um I was in a film called Supercon that came out a few years before that that was kind of similar that um was directed by uh Zach um God, Zach's going to be really pissed that I've forgotten his uh, forgotten his last name but he did the uh, John Milius documentary and he, uh, I'm, I'm in actually a lot more uh, background scenes in that. And there's a scene where some characters are like reading my books and stuff. So uh, Zach Knutson, that's the uh, the uh, the filmmaker's name. And I'm again, Zach, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry. I love you. Um, I'll keep liking your Instagram posts. Um, <laughs> Forgive me, Zach, so, please. Um, Zach, uh, Zach's a good guy, and he. Um, he was the guy in Clerks 2 who does the um the uh the intimate scene with the uh the the donkey. I knew the that end. name sounded familiar. Yeah, yes. that's him. But that that's the sort of uh in comedy we were made to understand through Zach. Uh he explained that it's kind of um when you start off, they make you be the butt of the jokes. Like you when you're coming up, you have to be like the naked guy or the guy that like gets dumped in the septic tank or something like that so he said that was part partially how that happened his evolution as a filmmaker was he had to, to go through the the hazing of doing the really like abusive sort of parts um or to be abused upon anyway um so yeah jay and silent bob reboot uh i was on set i was there with a bunch of people i'm only in the background in that one scene uh super con i'm in a few more scenes mostly just crowd stuff talking to people and they have a scene where something funny happens people are like fighting or driving a by in a bike or something and a bunch of people are holding up my books like all of them are all by me and they all go and watch something really funny like well, again it's somebody's chasing someone or whatever then they just go back to reading <laughs> um <laughs> So uh, I did get to meet Kevin Smith and talk to him for a while. Uh, we took a couple of like hype shots just in holding my stuff. I I absolutely love Kevin Smith's view askew uh, the view askew universe. Uh, when I saw Clerks when I was a kid, it was one of those um, moments like with uh, when I first read The Crow and Elf Quest, some of these indie comics in the eighties where they were just it was like if you want to do it, just go out and do it, figure it out. Like you don't have to like wait for a Marvel editor to call you on the phone. And in his case for Hollywood, he just went to, he literally went to one of those, like uh, it's, it was a, a school, but it's not like a university. He went to some filmmaking course. He saw like in a catalog or a magazine or something. And so he just paid the few thousand dollars and went and came back and then taught everyone else how to do whatever, everything he learned. So um yeah i was a uh, it was a real privilege and a pleasure to meet him um i'm really looking forward to clerks three so Same i mean I, that that's one of those uh movies that it was such a it made such a dent in me when i saw it that i was happy that the second one was really good and then i always like there's that part where the film just even as simple as it is it always you always kind of want to go back to that damn convenience store even though like it's a story about how two guys were just miserable but all the cartoons all the other there when dante and randall would always show up in the other universe films 
you always get that little bit of that twinge, that ache of like, God, we need just more of just these guys like arguing about <laughs> Star Wars and comic books and stuff. Um, you know, that's and that takes a special film to do that where you're just like more of this. And there's like a play. There's like a part of me missing now that there's not more. You know, my uh, my father once told me that he saw Star Wars in the theater in the 70s. And he said that um, he, he told me one time, so nothing ever has ever made me feel that way. And he said every sequel, prequel, whatever that I've ever watched has been there's this part of me trying to recapture the way that movie made me feel in 77 the first time. And I think it's a way for a lot of people. And for me, Clerks is not obviously not the only, but it is one of those movies, just like the first Crow film and, and like Star Wars and a few other things where it just it changes you after you see it. And then there's this part of you that just is trying to get that feeling back. Um, and occasionally, you know, you get lucky, you get a good couple of sequels or prequels or whatever, but most of the time it's kind of a one shot deal, you know? Mm. So obviously I'm conscious of the time. I know you need to get off and on, but if people, are listen- is it, if people are listening to this now and they're like, right, I like the sound of this Kurt Amaker guy. I'm going to go check out some of his books. I know this might be like asking you to pick a favorite child, but what would you recommend as like a prime example of what you can do? Uh, I think, just, uh, you know, I, I when I started, when I finished writing Dead Souls, I was like, I think this is the best thing I've ever written. However, I think that Tad Caldwell, to me, is the one that people have demonstrated that they like. I mean, the Dead Souls reboot, not the old one. But I think Tad Caldwell is the one thing that people have demonstrated to me they like the most. And I think as far as just a well-constructed and kind of appealing and interesting story that's not too, like, esoteric or obscure... I would always say Tad Caldwell for sure. The Cradle of Filth comic is fun and you can read it without being a fan of the band and still enjoy it, but it's pretty like blood and thunder, penny dreadful fiction. You know, it's got uh, lots of violence and vampires and nudity and just that sort of, that's not everyone's, that's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, I, uh, I'm pretty, but I would say either, Dead Souls is my personal favorite, but again, that was, again, me doing kind of a vanity project for my own enjoyment. I think the Cradle book is definitely, if you're a rock fan, music fan, Tad Caldwell, I think, is the one that is the most balanced and mainstream. And I don't mean that in a bad way, because to me, the the idea of doing what I did in that book was a few years before Stranger Things, which is the thing that's going to really annoy me is when that movie comes out, everyone's going to say, oh, this is the latest in the 80s throwback Stranger Things knockoffs. Well, I did Tad Caldwell a few years before Stranger Things, and my idea was to do an R-rated take on the kind of kids' adventure movies in the 80s. I wanted to do like a grown-up, mature version of Goon Monster Squad and then with some kind of elements from Donnie Dargo thrown in where it had like, it obviously had a science fiction element and element of the fantastic, but it was about those sort of pivotal moments in adolescence where you really cross from being, um, you know, I would say in a lot of those movies is where they cross over from being children to being adolescents. And in this case, more like crossing over from being uh, an adolescent to being a young adult, like an actual, when I say young adult, I mean like a, you know, 18, 19, 20, not when they say that now, they mean like 11 through 15 or whatever the <laughs> YA market is starting. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do an kind of an R-rated grown-up version of those. And again, that's not to say that that hasn't been done. I mean, Stephen King did pretty much invented that when he wrote like It, Stand By Me. He had the, the same sort of premise, but it hadn't been done in a long time. And I can't even say that I was a hugely like, I I've... I'm not like an obsessive about those movies uh, at all. I just, I mean, I've seen like Goonies maybe once. I've seen Monster Squad several times just because it rules. But um, <laughs> the uh, no, it does. Monster Squad is great. And it's one of those movies, if you get past the goofy premise, is actually a pretty solid flick under there. Um, the uh, and, But I remember that those movies really struck a chord with people when they came out. And I remember for me as a child, they were kind of like these intermediary, like they weren't children's movies like Disney and Disney was definitely kind of on a, on a not great run in the early eighties. That was when they had like, the the movies weren't landing until the little mermaid came out, but they had tried with uh, like black cauldron and there'd been a few other movies before and after that, that hadn't done really well. 
But back in the 80s, uh, if you like liked Disney, it was pretty much just as a, you know, as a child, it was like asking to get beat up. Like that was kids stuff. And the, but I remember movies like that, those sort of PG and PG-13 kind of kids adventure movies. Like they were, they were such where our parents would allow us to watch them, but they weren't like really, really corny or silly or considered childish. It was like this inner, this, this sort of bridge to, you know, like nobody, nobody looks down. I'm like watching Raiders of the Lost Ark or Temple of Doom or the original Star Wars trilogy. They were that kind of like, okay, this, this is not childish, but it's also still pretty, it's got some grit to it and, but it's not patently R rated. And so um, I just, not to get too far afield, but I had a good idea. And I was like, I remember those, I remember people liked them. And I remember that they resonated with me as much as anyone else did. So let me just do this and see how it goes. And then book comes, comes out, does pretty well. I move on. Didn't think much of it after that, but then stranger things comes out and then people, I had more than one person go, it was kind of similar to that Tad Caldwell comic you did. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I know I should have, I had played with the idea of maybe trying to write a screenplay out of it, but I was like, I guess I missed the boat on that one. I wasn't, I want to be very clear. I'm not um, trying to like take the piss out of the Duffer brothers. I love stranger things. It was just, it was derived from the same well. They took inspiration from the same source material, except that they actually went through with it in terms of a, a television show, not a movie. Um, I'm not saying they stole my idea or anything dumb like that. It was, you know, it was drawing inspiration from the same well, except they actually saw it through. Um, so hopefully we can ride that wave though. Um, and I'm, again, I'm sure it's some, I'll get some snark about how we're just trying to copy it, but it's, it's not the case. It was just, uh, an idea who I think I may have arrived at a couple of years early and then the idea's time came. And now there are a lot, if you go through Netflix, there's a, there's a movie called summer of 84. There's a whole bunch of other movies like that with synth wave soundtracks set in the eighties and the sort of like neighborhood kids are trying to solve a murder or fight a, you know, fight a monster or something like that. And I think it's cool. I like that stuff. I'm, I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're here. I mean, I, I was born, born in 80 and uh i'm glad i got to see that decade firsthand even through a child's eyes <laughs> so, <I'm> <laughs> so before we let you get out of here and so what have you got coming up what are you working on at the moment that, that you can talk about graphic novel sequel to tad caldwell uh i mean it's being lettered right now it's got art by jc grande who has done work for image and idw before he did a book several years ago called uh, johnny monster and he penciled a uh, Immortal 60 for me, which was a two issue mini that is now just available as a soft cover graphic novel. And uh, he's done other uh, work for me in like, he, I think he did uh, some of the 69 eyes work and he's uh, come in a couple of times. I needed a, like a cover at the last minute of someone else back out. He saved my ass a couple of times over the years. Um, but uh, Carl Slominski, who drew uh, Tad Caldwell, the first one was not available and Carl and I are still friends, but he is like 110% committed to developing his own stable of like creator owned projects. And I completely respect that. There was no like animosity. He just said, no, I'm like, I'm on this path. I've got to stay here and put out like his stuff's coming out. There's scout comics. He's got a book called cult of Icarus. That's a, a vampire story that I am going to wait and get the trade paperback. Cause I don't buy many. I do get still read comics, but I don't buy many floppies like outside of a couple of titles but um i'm really excited about it and i'm really happy for the success he's had but uh jc had kind of a similar style to carl it's not exactly the same but he had sort of like angular kind of um kind of junky style and i mean that again not as a pejorative it's just it's sort of a uh, lots of little details and background bits and and kind of uh sharp angles and so I showed it to the original to JC and I said, do you think you can like kind of keep this style up with the understanding that you're not him and it's not going to be exactly like him? And he said, yeah, I think I can handle that. So, okay. Uh, he is in the process of drawing it. The book is about, I want to say about 140 pages or so. Um, I could be misremembering that, but I'm lettering through it right now. Um, and JC is drawing it. So, we hope to have that out by the end of the summer, give or take. Uh, it'll be in bookstores probably. I mean, the comic distribution is really scattershot. There's like 
Diamond almost folded during uh, during the pandemic, and it didn't. It's still around. There's also a couple of other uh, distributors right now, so I need to get a handle on who I need to send this to. Besides, getting in bookstores is very easy. That's just a I'm a small publisher. I have an account with a distributor, but the comic shops are a little different. Um, also, the third issue of the Cradle of Filth miniseries, Maledic- Maledictus Athenaeum. Um, I did the Bathory Aria issue, um, which is my fictional biography of the sort of Cradle of Filth version of Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess, not the, I want to be very clear, it's not the historic version. Uh, I've been to the castle. I've talked to like the three English language scholars on the planet. Uh, actually, I've talked to two of the three that study her, so I'm I'm very big into legit history. But this is very much the, you know, kind of like high gothic blood bathing witchcraft that kind of thing. Um, the yeah, best album as well. Yeah, um, oh. it's, it's, my, it's my personal favorite, along with Dusk and her embrace. Um, mm. Although I I have to give it to them, their um their most recent album is is a banger. They really did a good job with um. There's a song on there called uh, How Many Tears to Nurture a Rose. And it's just, I've told Dan this. It's not like some, you know, I'm telling him tales out of school. I said, the album is good. Um, I like it a lot. But I said, that song is just like, that's among the best thing you've ever, best things you guys have ever put out. So, wow. um, yeah, they just did a video for it too. But um, it's, uh, God. I haven't got around to checking the new album yet, and you've just encouraged me to uh, go out yeah. and check it out. Yet. Um, it's uh, yeah, Danny, like I said, is a, is a good friend. I'm glad I've had as many chances to talk to him and stuff like that. And over the years, um, Existence is Futile, it's the name of the newest album. He um, he supported my career, he's been a good friend. He's been, you know, it's never been just a question of like working together because working together, I mean, it's definitely has an element to it because that's just life and reality. But uh, I would not be where I am without his help. And the fact that he just kind of like lent his name and spoke up for me and then, you know, brought me on board when he could have had anybody come on to do the Cradle comic. And then he did it again with this mini series because this is coming out through uh, Opus and Incendium, which is a separate, obviously not my company, and it's an anthology thing. So everybody, there's two issues so far and they've shipped directly from the publisher. Mine is the third issue. And those two issues both had two stories each. Mine has the entirety of the 30 pages. So I got the lo- I got a longer story, which is outstanding. Um, those have been, they were initially just sold through the publisher and then they got a distribution deal with Diamond. So those the Maledictus Athenaeum comics, both a, a prestige one that has been shipping from the publisher and a cheaper newsstand variant are going to be in comic shops um, starting in, um, I want to say the first issue will probably be there this month. So mine should be there by September because um, they're going to come out on a regular monthly schedule. So people that are looking for something new, if you ordered uh, the third issue of Maledictus Athenaeum, um, I know there were uh, there were some delays, and everybody's really aggrieved and sorry about that. But it should be shipping uh, imminently, is what I've been told. And the third issue will be in comic shops. And if you didn't want to pay sixteen dollars and sixty six cents for the uh, luxury edition, there's going to be a regular like floppy comic book newsstand version in uh in September along with that. So uh, Ted Caldwell graphic novel end of the summer, uh, new cradle comic third issue of, of six, just this one, just by me out in probably about September, unless you pre-ordered. So, and then the movie uh, holds out by the end of the summer. Busy, busy boy. Tom, have you got any questions? my friend? Yes. So over the pandemic, obviously, I didn't know how many cons did originally, but did you miss doing Comic Cons whilst the pandemic was going on? Like, has it been good to get back? Um, yeah, I have the only one I've done is the uh, that shop signing that uh, Geeky Vengeance was at. Um, and I liked doing cons. I like doing the smaller local cons because people that go to those as opposed to like Wizard World or Wizard World, I think has been rebranded. I think it's called like, fandom expo where it has it i'm not being i'm not trying to be cute i just don't remember the, what they've rebranded it as but um those things there's a uh, larger ones tend to be focused on more like media celebrities so you have television actors and professional wrestlers and some film actors and some rock stars and stuff um 
and those are fine, but the people that are there tend to not be shopping for like new and like new independent comics. They're not like looking for like a bold new creative vision. They're just kind of there because they want to, they want to cosplay and they want to see these like various media personalities. And that's fine. You know, people like what they like. Not, I don't, I don't have the energy to, you know, kind of a, a beat up on people for their interests or get into that sort of elitism, but it's just not really the market for underground and independent comics. So I can make a, do a pretty good signing, pretty decent sales and meet people at a shop signing, like for comic book day or one of the local cons that they have around here, because people that go in sort of, some of them are already fans from having seen me at cons over the years. And then some of them are people that are more likely they are actually looking for independent and underground stuff, or maybe even if they're looking for mainstream stuff, they're wanting, they want to buy like a local artist's um, drawing or depiction or like fan-made art uh, related to an existing media property that gets into a little bit of, that's a little sketch on the copyright side of things. Um, but that's part of the reason why everything I do is my, is mine or I'm, you know, hired and have permission to do it and stuff like that. I don't like have, you know, I don't sell like uh, fan fiction or fan. I don't even draw, so I couldn't sell fan art. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I do like, I do like the smaller independent cons, the bigger cons. I mean, if you can, if you've got the money to burn to go do them, they're a lot of fun. Like it's all great to be at the club parties and stuff after, but I've gotten, as I said, my absolute fill of, of drinking and partying over the years. Um, I just, I did it, I did it again. And then I did it some more. And I got to the point where uh, it just isn't as fun for me. And also I, I will say with the contentious uh, climate in America right now, I don't like crowds. Um, I, you know, I used to work for local Homeland security and do disaster preparedness and stuff like that. In addition to I've been in the Marine Corps and um crowds uh scare the hell out of me and i don't even mean that as a joke but the the propensity for someone to uh make an ied out of material at home depot that they could very, probably pretty easily get into a con or for a mass shooting or something like that um it just uh i'm not saying i'll never do another con again but it's like concerts i try to i do go to concerts occasionally i'm not saying i never go to them but i am always cognizant of that you know uh because it's just things are very, very contentious in the States right now. And you never know when somebody is going to decide to go out in a blaze of glory. So yeah. um, that's why I tend to stick to the low, to the smaller shows. Um, you know, the big ones, I end up paying more to be there than I make. And at some point it's like, okay, well, if I want to not make money, I can, you know, just <laughs> not get out of bed or something. You know, I can do that for free. You know? <laughs> um, oh. But finally, I wanted to ask as well, when you first started writing and first started making comics, et cetera, did you ever think that your life would get to where it is today, working alongside Danny Filth and the 69 Eyes and that sort of thing? Uh, no, but it's looking back, it, it, I can see how, how it was all. I, wanna, I don't want to say it was an inevitability, but the, the thing, the reason why I focus on those two bands is that I had my stable of bands that I listened to. Uh, through most of adolescence, like I said, I was a big fan of like Bauhaus, The Sisters of Mercy, Joy Division, um, Susie and the Banshees, Christian Death, the whole thing. I pretty much, I, I, I'd gone like, this was back when people got into the goth scene in the 90s. You went in, like, it was like a lifestyle. It was like, if you listened to something that wasn't in that family of music, like you had to hide it. Um, you did not want it to, you did not want people to see your like Nirvana CDs or something. Not that I was a massive Nirvana fan, but it was one of those things. Like if you were into metal, even if it was like Iron Maiden or something that's, you know, eminently respected, you would still pretty much get made fun of instead of, unless it was like maybe typo negative or Rob Zombie. But um, the, um, so getting into a new band that really took hold of me in both cases, that was, or as an adult, something really really resonated with me in a way that I hadn't in several years so it wasn't a question of like oh my god this is just an opportunity it was like whoa I haven't loved a band this much since I turned you know 16 or something and uh so yeah it was there have been, there have been other bands that I wanted to work with um the difference is is just we have not been able to hammer out a deal or frankly when you start telling them what it entails the level of like input and involvement um 
some fans have kind of like chilled on the idea because they're just like, uh, we can't, we don't have time to do all of that. I said, because I need input from the band. I can't just go and I need their participation. So it's like, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z. I'm mean, going to need the band to be available for this, this, and this. And then it turns into, well, okay, we, you know, we just were hoping you could just bang out a comic. And I was like, well, this, it, and it's okay. Like the people aren't, they're, if they're not making comics, they're musicians. So when they find all that out, sometimes it turns into like, okay, this is going to turn into a long-term conversation about how we can maybe get this out. So sometimes like there are people that I haven't written off the possibility of working with. We've talked over the years and it's going to probably be a matter of just waiting for when the time is right to do it. Or it's just, okay, it didn't happen. No harm, no foul. Nobody's I'm not mad at anybody. Deals fall through all the time. Um, so those were just two deals that worked out, but those were also two bands that were transformational when I got into them. Um, I have entertained the idea of working with other bands. I've talked to them and I don't want to say who, because then it turns into like, I don't want the, that to turn into a germ of a rumor that something's happening that was just yeah. back years ago. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely happened. I've had some chats backstage and over the phone with people. Um, but I like doing my own work too. I don't want to just be the rock comic guy. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. I don't mind doing that. I love contributing to music and I like DJing and promoting when I was doing it. I was, I was not much of a musician. I uh, played guitar a little bit when I was in, when I was a teenager and I just didn't take to it, but I found that I liked being around and supporting musicians and working on the kind of production and business side of things just fine and being like an advocate for musicians and not just, I was like, okay, uh, maybe I'm not going to be on stage playing, but I can like make sure the concert happens and do this other stuff. I like licensing and production and things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's really it. Those are two big, those are two bands that I got into very fulsomely as an adult and the deals also worked out, um, which doesn't always happen. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm happy about it. I love Danny and Yerky to death are two of my best friends. And that to me is also just a huge deal to be able to go from being like a super fan to being like friends and talking to somebody on the phone and just being able to hang out. But also when you look back and you, okay, if you like something that much, as much as I did and you, you, there's a good chance you may chase it down. You will, you will find a way if you like something so fulsomely that you're just like, by any means necessary, will I, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. That's amazing. Kurt, this has been so much fun talking to you and learning all about what you do. And I think this has been absolutely amazing. Before yeah, we do let me. it go, though, have you got any plugs, social medias, any websites, anything that you want people to go check out? I'm at uh, KurtAmaker.com, DarkNotesPress.com. Uh, Instagram is my name, just Kurt Amaker. Facebook is Kurt Amaker Comics. And Twitter is under my company's name, Dark Notes Press. Uh, I just do, I use Twitter purely for promotional stuff, just so I've got a book coming out. I don't, uh, I don't engage. I don't argue with people. And um, yeah, I, I think um, um, the comics industry has uh, become kind of contentious because of social media uh, the past few years. I, I stay out of all of it. I just want to like, I'm over here just doing my work, you know, minding my own business. <laughs> yeah. I totally understand that. Twitter's become so toxic. It's crazy. Um, Kurt, thank you so much, my friend. This has been an absolute blast. I've enjoyed every single second of it. Absolutely, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kurt. Really means a lot. Thanks. Enjoy your day. Take care, sir. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Just phenomenal. What I'd, I'd absolutely love this. It's fascinating. I love how passionate he is about what he does. Like he sold me on those books. I really, I want to read all of them, especially that new Cradle of Filth one. All about like their best album they've ever done. So yeah, yeah. absolutely sold me. Superb conversation. Is it? And if he's at a con, make sure you go and see him as well. Make sure you get involved. Just go to where go to put Kurt Amica into Google and hit up his website and go and grab some stuff off there. It'll be very much worth your time. I trust you. Trust me when I say it. Kurt, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. We absolutely loved every single second of it. And I hope that you guys enjoy listening to it as much as we did recording it. All right. Is this thing on? Well, howdy doody, everybody. This is Braden Berry from Say We Can Fly, founder of Stay Cozy Clothing. Your one-stop shop for the coziest, most fashionable hoodies, t-shirts, and more. Gorsh, Mickey. That's right, folks. And we're proud to say that we are now sponsoring... The Chronicles of Podcast.
Ouch. Hosted by Tom and Jamie. <laughs> like, you can get 10% off, man. That's right, Shaggy. Just use the special code, The Chronicles, at checkout. Oh, boy. Oh.